Hi, I am resident of Collinwood, joined with Captain Patrick McRae and Captain Butch Rosenbaum. How are you guys? Very well. I'm good. We're here to discuss Star Trek Deep Space Nine, the Cardassians, uh, and the Bajoran War. But, Butch, when did you first watch Star Trek Deep Space Nine? When it, when it, when it first aired. Uh, I, I remember coming on and Next Gen was really in its, uh, its heyday. And uh, I tell you, the, the funny thing is, is when it started, I really didn't like Deep Space Nine. I hated the station. Did I didn't like the characters. And, um, but, I, you know, I gave it, it's like, okay. You know, I know that's the, the trendy thing to say now is Star Trek fans always hate the new series. It's like, okay, well, you know what? I'm going to watch this because Next Gen, the first two seasons are, are pretty stinkerific. And by... The end, uh, well, actually, uh, I think it's the fourth or fifth episode, Duet. I was like, man, this, wow, this, this is something different. Mm -hmm. This is, this is something great. And, and by the end of it, I remember by the, when the season, fin or series finale ran, I felt like I had been living there. And I was part of, you know, Starfleet or whatever. And I was being forced to, you know, I was being shipped off to somewhere else. I felt like I'd left my home. I think that last season, and especially the last couple of months of that show, uh, was the most profoundly long-term, emotionally involving stretch of television that I lived with from week to week. Let me ask you something. Did you have an experience towards the last season or two of the show where you were talking to a friend about it and it was almost like you were reporting the news. Yeah. Like you're reporting what yeah. was going on with the yeah. Dominion War. I had that experience several times. And I was really, I really kind of wondered if they were going to kill them, kill part, at least part of the cast of, in the final episode. I mean, they really were. I had no idea what was going to yeah, happen. Yeah, I mean, because we always figure, well, okay, maybe they'll kill one person, you know, to yeah. shock us. And they might kill everybody. Yeah. And it, I, it, I'm, I have no faith. Soto was so sick. They, <laughs> No, he was. Yeah. Odo was dying. He was. Yeah. I forgot. Yeah. I mean, Odo was, Odo, or no, Odo was fine. It was the founder. Yeah. It was the Salome Jens, the founder, who was sick uh, because she she basically got an STD from Odo, engineered by Section 31. I mean, that's think about it. That's what they did is they gave her the clap because when she melded, she that's it. that's where yeah. she got the 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 phage or whatever, and yeah. then gave it to the rest of the Great Link. Yeah, well, but that's what happened. She got, they basically. Yeah. I never thought of that. It, yeah. it was it was VD that brought <laughs> brought down the Dominion. It's true. When when Odo is laying there dying too, like Kira's like over him. It's like. My wife's like, is he going to die? I'm like, and I didn't want to spoil it. I, I kept silent. She kept hitting me. She's like, is he going to die? Is he going to die? I'm like, just watch it. Because <laughs> she had never seen Deep Space Nine. That's the sign of good storytelling. If if you get to a point where there is a, a regular character or or even a vaguely constipated character, and you and you 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 actually think, wow, this person they may they may get rid of this person. Of course, now that's become sort of standard on TV. You know, uh, yeah, they they they're getting rid of the Allison Pill character on Picard. Uh, kind of given the past season, it's too bad they're not getting rid of the rest of the cast. And uh, um, it's funny because it's all Star Trek, so whatever. Um, you know, Picard has been pretty. Uh, uh, this season and they made a huge mistake because the idea was they were going to premiere strange new worlds after the finale of Picard. But the way modern television is, they just released them both first thing in the morning or at midnight or whatever. And so it's like, you know, screw Picard. I want to watch strange new worlds. And I did. And it was so good. I had absolutely no interest in watching the last episode of Picard at all. Have you seen it yet? Uh, no, I, I have You're gonna love sworn it. off. Well, I, I thought you about season two for Picard. No, no, Strange New Worlds. I know, I they made it. a Star Trek episode. I saw your, I saw First your time in 35 years we got a re oh. and you'll know what I mean when you see it. 
no, I, I swore off of Picard because uh, I, I know I'm the weird Star Trek fan. I cannot stand Loki, and I don't know why they call him Q, but um, oh. I, I hate every time Q came on. I had if I would have to force myself to watch it. And it, that's not an insult on John Delancey. I just don't find that character very. It's all your days of our lives uh, baggage. The uh, it was that scientist who created you the said robot. We would never talk. Yeah, about I know. That. That's, yeah. To me, Picard season two should have been Starfleet Brennan and Picard. And I know, I know, Patrick Stewart's not getting any younger. And they give him a file, and they say. He goes, well, am I getting a new career? And like, this is sort of where we get into. We've we've seen this in other series where there's been spy characters. They're making Picard a spy, like a spy who's done it before. Yeah, got great. He got horribly tortured. Right, and that's that's the thing. Like, why not take a chance and do something with that character instead of? I felt season two was too predictable too. Like, they just you knew what was coming. Yeah, I, I, I just think it was good. That's my <laughs> big thing. It was good. Like, yeah. There's hey, that, too. I'll here for just a second, if you don't mind. Um, is, is, I know Patrick Stewart's not a young fellow, but, I mean, he moves so... Shufflingly. Well, that's that. that and, and precise, it's a... He, it's, is he in bad health? Because he just looks like... There was some, like, clickbait no, article no. I saw recently. I didn't read it, but it said the tragic truth about Patrick Stewart or something like that. I don't know. I mean, you know, he's had a full life. He's been he's an athletic guy. Um, He's had a full life. So, I mean, you know, he's in his 80s. Yeah. But look at Shatner. Well, he's Shatner's a mutant. Oh, yeah. Shatner's a, a, a space-dwelling mutant. I wouldn't mind to look as good as him at 60 as opposed even before I get to 90. Yeah, I'm, I'm developing the physique of Shatner at 50, so, you know, go climb a rock. I got to ask you guys this. Sure. Galdicott or Galdar Hill, who's worse? Who's the uh, who? Who's the second one? Uh, Dar Hero is the one that ran the prison camp, uh, Galatev. Yep. Yeah. Oh, I, I well, Golda Cott's worse because he he was tough enough to make it into more episodes. Oh man, that, that's I, one you got a concentration camp commandant, and it, it ain't Clink and it ain't Schultz, right? Uh, but I, the Cott was. Uh, I would one day like to meet Mark Alimo or however you say his name, and just shake his hand and tell him. <laughs> Part of me wants to shake your hand, and the other part just, just wants to punch you across the face. Because he was such a good villain. Um, the, I guess... Tell it to the judge. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'll, I'll go to Cut also, but... Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, is it Hitler, or is it Mengele? Uh, they're, they're both pretty bad. Yeah. It's like they are the, uh, they're the, the Reese's Cup of Evil. <laughs> yeah. yeah. They're like the Reese cup with the potato chip. It's bad. <laughs> Never done that to myself. <laughs> Don't. <laughs> but I'll tell you what is good. You take an Oreo and you dip it in Nutella, and then and you're gonna think I'm crazy. You roll it in bacon bits. Anything with bacon bits. Because you got the yeah. salty and you got all the t- anyway. Back to the show. <laughs> anyway, so. I love how when they do a flashback of the war and they're showing the tunnels and stuff, it's really gritty and it's really heartbreaking when Kara Norris is sort of talking about those times and she says how they raped the women and beat the men. They don't show that, but the description of it is enough. What did you guys think of that? Uh, It was sexist. You know, it should have been equal time. Uh, where you know equal atrocities for both genders, and I think we've come a long way. Now we would have half the half the women beaten, half the women raped, half the men beaten, half the men raped. Oh. That's progress. I, it was horrible. I mean, what do you, it, it, was a, it was a terrible, terrible moment, and it led to Kira saying the line that she said in every episode for about the first four years, which is, "I've been fighting Cardassians since I was old enough to hold a face." Yeah. Yeah. Just like Odo, his line in every episode was, I'm keeping my eye on you, Quark. Or, 
<sighs> that was a good one too. Uh, I don't. What do you think? Yeah, I agree. I agree. Um, a good performer can sell that. Um, you don't have to always show things to to convey horror. Oh or God, it's better. better. Sometimes it don't. I, I exactly, exactly because. What may be utterly horrific to me is going to be a little bit different than, than Patrick or to you or to you know, anybody that watches this. Right. So, and, there, and there's something almost merciful when an audience is just has it left to their imagination, because then when you when you see it, it's like, well, yeah, that's a that's a that's a Holocaust moment, and um, and you almost feel. Like there's a contract with entertainment or dramatic presentations that it's it's really only going to go so far. And when it goes to the point of showing you, uh, sometimes the extremity is the point, like in Dawn of the Dead. Mm -hmm. But but you kind of go into Dawn of the Dead knowing that that's going to be the thing. First time I saw it, I did. Oh, you did? not Yeah. yeah. Oof. But, uh, but you know, so, so I think there is a mercy towards yeah. the audience when you don't have to see. And you that don't stuff. have to show it when it's done well, because yeah. you, 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 you have that mercy that you're talking about, but you know what happened. You, you don't have to, to, and you don't have to show it every time. Yeah. Once you've said that. Um, I mean, well, it's, it's like why Schindler's List is so powerful, but also... It just you feel weird. Yeah. And and even there, I know it's controversial, but even there are elements of Passion of the Christ that get so violent. You know, it's so it's not Jeffrey Hunter. No. And it, it's so violent and it's so extreme that I, it's like I get so many feels going on watching that it's almost like overload. I can't process it's them a all. Feel. Yeah, and it Schindler's List really got to the same point. When, you know, when I remember when people were getting capped in the in the the yard, and it's like, oh God, that was sudden. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah, yeah. I think what they did really well. Or sorry, go ahead, Butch. I was just say for a, a, a syndicated weekly show. Um, both of those films he just mentioned are great films. They're great films. films. Yeah. But I don't want to watch them all the time. Right. They're, a di they're, they're a different type of movie. Yeah, you kind of have to be ready for that. And, and while this is an important part of Deep Space Nine and, and the whole story, series and mythology, you, you, you don't have to put me through the gut punch every week. We can just go, okay, yeah, we, we know that was bad. And even in the back of your head, you might go, you know, that time that they beat the women and raped the men mm -hmm. as opposed to rape the women and beat the men. Yeah. Yeah, I think the one the where they really display this before they ever show like a flashback or going back sequences with Karen Norris when you see the actress playing her sort of give off this I don't know it, to me it's her body language too that she just looks at Cardassians and like hates them at times. I mean, her back stiffen. I mean, her, her whole posture changes. Yeah. With walk by. And of course, none of is a dancer. So she's very, very, very aware of her her body and space and the, what it's communicating. Who's you guys' favorite female character in the show? I have to pick one? Yes. Um... Yeah, I mean, what's your, what's your criteria for favorite? Do you mean like who I think is the best acted, who I think is the most important, who I think is interesting, who I would, would want to hang out with? You could, whatever you choose, man. It doesn't matter by criteria. For me, Jed Zia hits all those points. Yeah, and I'm an Esri man. Yeah. But you're a little more Worf, and I'm a little more Bashir, yeah. so, uh, yeah, you know, works. yeah. And, but, we're, but we're friends, and we have yeah. a lot of similar, yeah. similar interests, so that's why it's we're kind of attracted to the same woman. You, exactly. Different Just, facets yeah. of them, her, yeah. her or him, shall we? Yeah. Uh, I, I, liked, uh, I like Martok's wife. Oh, God. 
<laughs> that was my first wife. <laughs> yeah. And, but we didn't stay together. Yeah. Um, well, a lot of interesting women on the show. I mean, you know, uh, I, I have to say, as, as well intended, Kara has a very special place in my heart. Um, I like Cassie Yates a lot. Yeah, you know, he asked that, and I was just going, well, yeah, yeah, I think it's Cassie Yates. But uh, here's here's a dark horse. Uh, uh, Kai, Kai Wynn, who is so awful. But Louise Fletcher is so good. Yes. And so arctic and plastic in her awfulness. I mean, you know, we forget that she was really maybe the, the Darth Vader notwithstanding the greatest film villain of the 1970s, Nurse Ratchet. Uh, I, Vader wouldn't have done that to those guys. No. And um, and so, you know, she's basically just fulfilling the prophecy, the destiny of Nurse Ratchet. And, you know, in terms of a character, when they come on screen where I go, okay, it's going down. Something's happening. Something intense, something interesting. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, gosh, I like her also. We watched, um, last week on Sfinguli, uh, there was, uh, the 85 Invaders from Mars, which she Oh, yeah, in, yeah, yeah, she is. In, in, isn't she like, like an evil school teacher or something? Yeah, well, she gets the possessed yeah. by the Martians. Hopefully that's not a 40-year-old spoiler. No, uh, Karen but, <laughs> <laughs> And we were watching that, and uh, I said to my wife, I said, oh, yeah, I said, there's Kai Wynn again running her damn mouth. I'd like to punch her. And yeah. she's like, and, she asked, who's Kai Wynn? And, and I pointed out uh, that that was Nurse Ratchet. And my wife, Jill, had watched uh, the Nurse Ratchet series. It was on oh, Netflix. Yeah. She really liked that. Yeah. And I was, I don't think she realized who Nurse Ratchet was. Yeah, so Louise Fletcher. I explained, I explained all that. And I said, Louise Fletcher is just like Mark Alamo. You want to shake their hand and you want to punch them. Not real. I mean, I don't, I don't want to punch either one of them really, right. but they play such a good villain that they generate that feeling. You know, for being a sleazy degenerate, I, I do have certain lines I try not to cross, uh, which, which will amaze people who've seen me on Jules' show before. But uh, but all seriousness aside, uh, I, I do find Louise Fletcher kind of strangely attractive. Really? Yeah, I can't explain it. She reminds me I of I can't uh, explain it. I just, you know, I she's... find her strangely attractive. Right? I have a lot, well, they're not really aunts, they're actually cousins, but they're from the generation before mine, that they're mm -hmm. my dad's cousins, and, but, you know, being in the South, we call them aunt and uncle. Sure. I've got a few aunts that she reminds me of, but I simple? just, no, they're not, okay. and, and if they were, I wouldn't do that to you, <laughs> but that's who she reminds me, it's just like, well, child, now don't yeah. you know better than that, yeah. you know, and uh, it just, it hit a nerve with me so much with her. I think every every great heel has a seduction quality to them, and I think that's what uh, Fletcher does so well. She's very seductive with her voice and her tone. She's can be, yeah. You know, she. I love how she's even when she's talking to a woman, like when she's talking to Narice, It's like she's almost like trying to seduce, like not in a sexual way, mind you. Right. No. Yeah. But in a way of she's like trying to seduce her to side with her. <laughs> down at the end of the series though because she and Mark Alimo are getting all crazy. That was, my, that was my favorite part. It's like, you know, do you know? Oh yeah. Do you know who yeah, you're doing yeah, that yeah, with? Yeah. It's like go to my ear is dating um Mila or, or Goebbels oh, and, and yeah. just and you know I, you know my family is of Jewish descent. I'm not Jewish obviously but so you know I have complete respect for go to my ear but just knowing Kai Wynn and her doing that. I, I, every time they'd show them together, I'd just get the biggest grin. <laughs> but yeah, I, I agree with you, Joe. She has, I mean, and that's something about her her performance. Um, you know, she'll be talking and, and then like she'll kind of look, kind of not breathy, but kind of look, now Patrick, is that really how you want to do that? You know better than and then she does what you're asking me to do, Kai and, Webb. And she'll just switch. Yeah. And she comes out with Nurse Ratchet and she's nah. like verbally beating you over the head with Thor's hammer. And yeah. it's just wow. 
Adami, I think is her name. It is Adami. Yeah, Adami. Yeah. It sort of, it sort of reminds me a bit of Reverend Trask from Dark Shadows or Gregor yeah. Gregor Trask of it. Trask. Yeah. Yeah, 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 very much so. It, it, where she's not afraid to use her religious sway and her proxy to get her way. And Trask is the same way. Well, and and there's a there's a difference. Okay. We don't really. I mean, your your similarities right on the money. The thing about uh, Kai Wen that I think makes her even more complex is that we don't see her or really get to know her prior to the episode of Emissary. Right. We don't know what she was like, and. I get the feeling that because because Kyle Paca seems like a pretty sensible person. And if Kai Wynn is the number two, you know, who's going to move into that slot, Kyle Paca is, you know, kind of psychic and, and is a decent, you know, leader. And so I get the idea that, you know, Adami Wynn is fine or Wynn Adami or whatever she should be in, in Bajoran. Uh, I get the idea maybe she's fine. And it's when. She yeah she gets elevated to office, and that's great. And maybe she had the assumption that she was going to be the emissary. And then here's this guy from out of nowhere, this human, human, uh, this human shows up and and takes it. And I think that may be the thing that just drives because that happened in Christ's time. There. Were all of these other guys who, including Herod Agrippa, who fulfilled pretty much the prophecy yeah. and the fact that they weren't it made them all nutso. I want to take that because I was I was doing a little reading today and uh, just refreshing myself. And uh, Wynn was uh, a resistance fighter. Okay. And I believe I read... <clears throat> that she had been captured and may have been in one of the camps. So add in, take with what you've got there. Yeah. Whatever happened in, you know, in some, some, some God forsaken, I'm sorry, prophet forsaken uh, <laughs> concentration camps. She probably got a little broke mentally there, which yeah. is completely understandable. And she holds on to this. I'm going to be the emissary. I'm going to be the, the thing that got her then, Yeah. And, yeah, yeah. I mean, she's. Uh, I tell you, uh, you talk about she's not afraid to use her religion. I'll be nice and not name any names, but my dad is a Baptist preacher, so I and I've got a lot of cousins, uncles, and whatnots that are various officials in, in the Baptist faith, and I have seen a lot of preachers and deacons' wives be in a, a similar way, that slightly condescending, and it's like. You're, you're you're not anybody but they that, that's part of the reason i dislike her so much is i know a lot of people that would of course they didn't do anywhere near as charming or as cool but very similar yeah actions and and, and ways of doing things you know the only thing that that gives uh win sort of a leg up and this is the thing that must be so slippery for cisco to deal with is that they do have the orbs they do have these things you know the 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 deacon and so on are deacons because everyone agrees that that that's what they need to do uh but everyone could suddenly stop agreeing with that and they and they're no longer it but if you've got an orb yeah. that gives everyone a vision that says okay this is what's going to happen well it's like shit okay, well, stop if, with it. if if the god or gods however you look at that of your religion you know if i'm telling you i'm the emissary then you have a vision and our our chosen deity is yeah. telling you yeah he's the he's the chosen it, one. it's basically like if your church had a burning bush yeah that you know yeah. just it carried around and, and it's like yeah he, it's him it's him mm -hmm. Leave him alone. Take off thy shoes. Behold his mighty hand. <laughs> Let me ask you guys this. Do you, th do you think, the because the prophets do choose Cisco, do you think that the prophets can sort of sense when someone's wanting power, sort of like a Kaiwen? Oh, I think so. Oh, yes. and, 
and the prophets, you got to realize you just brought in a very wacky can of worms because, oh, they chose Cisco. They chose Cisco in a big way. They yeah. created him. You know, they basically created Cisco to seal the breach of the par wraiths. Mm -hmm. The whole reason that Cisco exists, I think, is to finally do battle with the Pa Wraiths that they knew existing out of time, they knew were going to be released by Gul Dukat. I think it'd be interesting if some very intelligent writer were to do a uh, timeline, if you will, of the prophets from the prophet's point of view. Not, you know, not 1968, 69, 70, 71, 72. But, you know, they're, they're, the couple of prophets are hanging around and are like, oh, crap, the power are getting. We, we need to do something about it's, that. It's a uh, cloud. What about this album here? Yeah. It's a cloud because the thing is, is time doesn't really exist for them. Exactly. Mm -hmm. That's the... That, that's why you need somebody that's very intelligent and can tell a good story that way. Mm -hmm. It's really tough. Because I mean, that's one of the great paradoxes about God is that if God is all powerful, God exists not just everywhere, but every when. And that's a big idea. When you throw that idea to somebody for the first time, that's huge because then it takes on the whole question of hell and predetermination. And it's that's a that's a crazy, crazy, crazy thought. And they root the, the whole uh, ontology of Deep Space Nine in that nonlinearity. Yeah, you know, if that's a word. Yeah. If it isn't, I understood. Yeah, I think we all get it. Yeah. I remember going to church and before going to church as a kid, the first time my mom sat me down and she goes, listen, I don't want you to feel scared going here. Because she could understand how a kid could see church as a scary thing. And she said, understand this. The devil and God want one thing, your soul. And it's as much up to you as it is them who gets it, you know. And I think that was a fair, ex like, and I said, okay. <laughs> yeah. so she goes, don't let, you know, don't let, really, she goes, don't let anybody who represents God tell you, you know, something you know is wrong in your conscience, you know. And I think that's, that's something I try to tell my kids, like, look. I believe in God. I pray to God. We go to church, but at the same time, don't you know? I hate to say Bible thumpers or people who, because Butch is right. There are people who use God in a certain way, you know, to advantage. And I think that's something Kaiwin did. And also, there were there were characters who, what was that one guy's name? Um, the guy who got killed off who Norris was having sex with. Um, what was his name? Oh, God. Parker Barash. Vedic Barash. Yeah. It was in Monster Squad. Yeah, he was yeah, in Monster Vester, Squad. Yeah, 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 yeah. Dracula in Monster Squad. Wouldn't it be great if you had played Dracula in Monster Squad on Deep Space Nine? Anyway. Your point. Well, my point is he wasn't using religion in a negative way, whereas in Kaiwin was or wasn't trying to use it to his advantage where Kaiwin was. So there was a yin and a yang. Well, OK, so this is another very important thing to talk about when we start bringing in the Bajoran. Because really, I mean, the Bajoran Cardassian war is like, well, Bajoran's good, Cardassian's bad. You know, next subject. But but wrapped up in that war are all sorts of interesting subtopics and you know St star trek is kind of at least the federation is kind of a, a secular organization and that meant for at least next generation that uh it was really impossible for them to talk about religion uh from um uh, I hate to say it, from a Catholic point of view, from a universal point of view, right. looking at a lot of different aspects and, and looking at the basic truth that, uh, you know, religion is not inevitably a destructive force. 
you know, by its nature, which is what Roddenberry would have argued. And, you know, while Gene was in charge, well, Gene, it's your show. You can say what you yeah. want. And that was a radical position to take back then. But I think, you know, after that position was stated and after it was kind of safe to be secular on TV and kind of just get that out of TV's system, it's like, okay, you're welcome to the table too. Mm -hmm. uh, things by necessity, I think, sort of loosened up. And with Deep Space Nine, rather than just go for the most, for, for the simplest uh, editorial, I won't say uh, uh, fact, I'll just say editorial that, you know, oh, this is a, this is a problem for society. Instead, it's, you know, when is it a problem for society? What happens, what goes wrong with religious organizations, with the people running them, not religion, but people running them, that creates the problem? Because that's a much more responsible dialogue to have. And that's a useful dialogue. I mean, yeah, it's nice to equip the kid with his, you know, Gene Roddenberry quotes to say at school when he goes in and, you know, whatever. And that's cool. But eventually that kid's going to get into high school. He's going to get into college. And the discussion is, is going to be a lot more complex. And so that, to me, is what Deep Space Nine is doing. It's not, it's suddenly it's not saying, okay, religion's inherently bad. Is religion's a, a cultural force like anything else, it can be good or it can be bad. And don't write it off. Don't condescend to it. The most useful thing we can do is to, especially to give people of faith, uh, touchstones so they can go, oh, that's what we need to avoid. We need to avoid a Kai win. We need to avoid that kind of politics, either abusing our faith I was going to, your yeah. future, Mike, I was going to throw in. Sure. But also, don't f b follow blindly. That's right. I mean, you, you don't, I, I, I honestly kept thinking they were, they, I don't know if they should, but they were going to have like a little sect of the Jorans go off and do a Jim Jones type thing. Sure. Yeah. Uh, or on the other hand, maybe, maybe Kira could have had a crisis of faith. And mm -hmm. you know, and, and she's the one who starts referring to these as the wormhole aliens. As Cisco starts calling them the prophets, uh, that would have been a really interesting season eight uh, storyline. Um, is is just okay? May, maybe that maybe that flip flops, and you have the Jim. Maybe it's tied together. You have the Jim Jones cult, and you know maybe she says, "Well, let, let's let's look at these from every angle." Yeah. You know, Benjamin used to call them this for the longest time. Yeah. Yeah, it's a really. Uh, at first, I thought when they when they brought in the religion elements on DS Nine, I I you know heathen that I am, I kind of rolled my eyes and I said, this this was like Star Trek was the one safe place I had, but now now that I'm the age I'm at, I'm really grateful that they did, and I'm grateful that they were as respectful as they were, and that they they used it to really pinpoint the problem and the problem is corrupt people mm -hmm. taking advantage of a faith and the political power of it one of the people one of the main creative forces on deep space nine is i'm sure i know me and patrick know because we've discussed it and i'm sure Jill knows is ron moore who went on to do the new battlestar galactica yeah, in, in and the Nons. yeah and that that same topic came up there with the mm -hmm. monotheism of the Cybons in the uh, Ron Moore universe. And, and that was the weird thing, is that he just went full-on religion at the end. I always wondered if that... I, I, I didn't... Well, I, I didn't always... Once I kind of caught on to it, I thought, hmm, I wonder if he's dealing with... or, or, or dealing with topics or subjects that he couldn't or oh, didn't man. think about during Deep Space Nine. It's like, hmm, what about this? Yeah, I, th I think that's... I think that's exactly what he did. Yeah. I think that's something a lot of the sci-fi shows have been really good at is dealing with religion and characters who take advantage of it. Not just Deep Space Nine, but Stargate SG-1. The movie did it too, in a sense. But Stargate SG-1, as you said, the new Battlestar Galactica definitely did that. And that's the thing. It's like, I want a show that's not afraid to tackle these subjects. It's like, hey, great. You know, if you can tackle that and get away with it and... But and, not be so preachy about it. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. 
there's still room for a good old fashioned secular story. Uh, Orville, man, end of, I think Orville's first season, they did a hell of a story. That was, did you see Orville? I, I have problems with something okay. for Well, I, I urge you to, to, to get, I, give, I it, give it a, a more thorough shot. try. I just, but they had a, they had a really, they had a really, really good Who Watches the Watchers style episode. That was, it was just, it was, it was, it, it looked at religion from a macroscopic historical point of view. Uh, and it's classic kind of Star Trek, which the best of Orville is, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and, um, and in it, uh, there's a race that's like Brigadoon, and it comes into our universe for about 10 minutes every, you know, but, but you know, like every six months it shows up again, six weeks it shows up again, but for six minutes, but, you know, a thousand years have passed. Uh. And so there's an artifact that gets left behind, and one of the crew members is seen and has a name and heals somebody. It's the Adrian Palaki character. And so when they when it shows up again, it's the Middle Ages, and they have an entire religion built around her. And, and you know, and everything's kind of fine. They sort of go, well, that's weird. Um, but then it gets to a real kind of almost global Israel and Palestine war in the 20th century equivalent of it. And the robot, Isaac, stays behind uh, and just kind of says, no, we, we are, we're not saying whether or not there's a religion. We're just saying we're not the gods, you know. And, and they come and they get the robot, who's now been there for a thousand years as a teacher or something, but it's only, you know, a few weeks for the crew. And it was a cool episode. Yeah, that's also kind of an interesting parallel. Uh, if you you know, uh, if the Adrian Adriana parallel, if she's if she's God, and then the the robot comes and then he stays with them for a while, is he Jesus? Well, yeah, not, sure, not literally, sure. but he's the he's the he's the the revised edition, the two point that comes to explain and he's that. he's indestructible and constantly explains that he's a machine. You know, and that's the that's the difference is that you know they just they can't they can't do anything with those big things. I am not a god. Stop shooting me. You shot me. Didn't do anything. All right, still not a god. Just a big machine. <laughs> and then they turn out to be the villains in in season two, and they're they're horrific. Oh really? Yeah. It's it is a there is a shit your pants moment in season two that is best of both worlds. Part one ending jaw dropper. It's a really good show. What did you guys think about Odo when they sort of reveal he's sort of caught in the middle between the Cardassians and the Bajorans because he worked on Tarok Nor as the security investigator? Uh, you know, in, in conflicts in offices and things like that, you have the person who you think you can trust and insist on remaining neutral and it drives you crazy. And Odo is that character in a I lot of ways. I'm becoming that. At your office? Word, just, uh, because I, I do the mail for my company, so I, I'm around most everybody in the company. Yeah. But uh, as, as a friend pointed out, you're, you're like, you're, it's like we're the Empire, but you're like Darth Vader. You're part of us, but you're kind of over to the side. So uh, I'm not sitting next to uh, uh, Jim, DeForest, and, and, and Leonard, uh, but I see them all. So I'm kind of the I'm neutral party sometimes. Yeah. So, yeah, I, o I, I like is, that quite well. Odo is that, you know, where he's – because they expect him just to be four square against – you know what was going on. I said, no, I, I didn't. I was, I was doing my job. I was maintaining just the same job I'm doing now. And um, it was Richard Nixon. That was wasn't Odo. Uh, but it's eventually, you know, he he has to side with, you know, the good guys. Hey, Abajois. Oh, I yeah, I went through this last week with Jewel. Oh, bear, Jen. Aubergine. Wah. Wah. Aubergine Wah. Aubergine Wah. The bear is the is the emphasis. But he he was 
a fantastic actor. Uh, I think very underrated because I remember watching Benson. That's what I first knew. See, this is the thing. I didn't think he could do it. I didn't either. Because uh, my associations with him were playing tall, skinny, fussy, vaguely effeminate uh, kind of fuss budgets. Uh, because he's also Father Mulcahy in the, in in the, the MASH, MASH movie. movie. He's the real Father Mulcahy. And which is why I feel that if he had ever left DS9, they should have gotten William Christopher to take over the part. Uh, and that would have been fantastic. It would have been, it would have been, it would have been so wonderful. God, if they had brought him on as his brother or something, how good that would have yeah, been. Yeah, been long. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, uh, yeah, Renato Bergenois, though, I mean, this is a, a good LA stage actor because this is the thing. He, he, Armin, uh, Andy Robinson, all LA stage actors. And so the the crew putting this together would have seen them in plays around town and would have been aware of that. And so they had a much greater awareness of the range of a guy like Rene Aubergenois than than we do. And and yes, when I heard he was cast in the part, I thought, oh no, this is it. This Clayton Endicott the third. This is a disaster. What are they gonna get Jason Noble to play? <laughs> Yeah, Captain Cisco. Uh, you know, and Inga Swenson is uh, as as Kira Norris. So uh, yeah, but it, well, they Ethan Phillips. Yeah, that's yeah, that's Ethan, Ethan Phillips is a Ferengi. Um, and then he was um, he was Neelix. Neelix. Neelix, the most noble character. The reason Star Trek came into existence was for Neelix. If you say so. Yes, <laughs> My God. <laughs> So what did you guys think of the fact that once he does make a decision and side with, he, he's in love with Kara. So how shocked are you were that, that he was in love with her? Not. No. They, they, the actors had been surreptitiously laying the groundwork for that for a long time with glimpses. Mm-hmm. You know, once you're used to, you know, Barnabas suddenly being in love with Angelique, nothing else shocks you. It was it was believable. It, it wasn't. Was. It wasn't like it was a res. It was a respect driven workplace romance yep. that happens when two people get to really know each other under all sorts of circumstances. Mm-hmm. And a lot of I mean, they're both very no no nonsense uh, characters. Mm-hmm. You know, military. You know, militaristic in certain ways. Duty driven, honor driven. Um, you know, yeah. Do you guys think that, and I know we sort of were touching on Kai Wen a bit, do you guys think Kai Wen always knew secretly she was going to sort of tar- like, turn against her own people in a oh, way? No, she was, was going to save them. Uh, yeah. She's very, she's very prideful. She... Maybe she wasn't going to literally save them, but she was going to help whoever saved them in their moment of need. Yeah, she she thought you know, the the old saying, "What is it? The, everybody's villain is somebody else's hero." She thought she was the hero the whole time. Yeah. What did you guys think of? Um, oh God, I'm like blanking on names, but um, the spy, t- the tailor, God, Eric, yes. Yeah, I, I tell you, um, I knew Andrew Robinson, of course, from uh, Dirty Harry. Yeah. Um, and uh, I don't know, I think he was in uh, it was Trancers 2 or Trancers 3. Crazy? And, and, and I, I knew him from that time, too. And at first, he just, to me, my uneducated self, where I caught all what was going on, he's just so smarmy. Why, yes, Doctor. That's the way it should be. Because he wants to sleep with him. And um, and I, I remember turning to my friend, uh, not Bridges, but other James, the, uh, you know, the one yeah. passed away. I remember. I think he wants to sleep with him. He did. Um, he did. That was totally. Uh, uh, Joey, Andy, of course, had no idea. Yeah. And Andy Robinson completely revealed that. And I grew. To me, he was anti Q. Yeah. I, oh, good. It's a Garrick episode. All right. Yeah, there's something to drink. Sit down. There is no such thing as a bad Garrick episode or a bad Garrick scene. No. Nope. It just—it's like MSG. It just makes everything better. Uh, 
Yeah, and Andy Robinson's a, a marvelous actor. Uh, I know him from Dirty Harry, but uh, he was also in my favorite Twilight Zone episode, Profile on Silver, where he plays John F. Kennedy, uh, Lane Smith, as a, as a time-traveling descendant. It's the awesome. The goes back and tries yes. to save Yeah, yeah he's Kennedy in that. I remember seeing the episode, but I, I didn't. That was Andy Robinson. And then Andy Robinson, I think he was, he played Liberace in the, I think, the licensed Liberace posthumous TV movie. Because there were the two, Victor Garber, mm-hmm. also a Star Trek alum. Uh, uh, Victor Garber played Liberace in the, like, the gossipy. Yeah, the vel- like the Velvet Something like, like that. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. But he's a Andy Robinson made a great Liberace. He uh, Andy Andy Robinson. He uh, he obviously looked like one of the Everly Brothers. Does and I kept thinking he should have. He would have been perfect to cast as I don't know them well enough. But whichever one he looked like, he I would keep thinking he should have played that. One of the things I I learned when I was uh, in Los Angeles is that Andy Robinson was a hell of a stage director, also, and a marvelous writer. You know, there's this thing where he wrote these diaries to get into the character. He wrote all of these diaries, making up this vast background on uh, on Garrick. And when the show was over, he turned them into a novel. Stitch in Time, which is a very good novel. I, for me, it's, it is the best Star Trek novel in that The Bride of Frankenstein is the best horror movie. And what I mean by that is it's the best, Bride of Frankenstein is the best movie that's also in the horror genre. And Stitch in Time for me is the best novel. I mean, just a hell of a good piece of writing that just so happens to be in the Star Trek genre. It may not be the best example of Star Trek writing, but it's the, for me the best novel in, in, in all of that. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's a, God, my good. God, it's a good book. It is a great one. It huh. made me not interested in any of the Elias Vaughn yeah, follow up books. Yeah. I had no interest in that, especially because they put uh, a Bajoran Burt Reynolds on the cover. I, I you know, I never. I, I think you pointed that out to me. And in, in the, uh, for those of you that don't know, when they relaunch the Deep Space Nine uh, novels after the series ended, they introduced a character named Elias Vaughn, who was a commander. I yeah, think. I guess he took over DS Nine or something, uh, or, or something. I really don't remember it. But uh, one of the first novels that he appeared in on the cover, they drew him to look kind of like Burt Reynolds. It was just, I think it was just a photoshopped Burt. Um, but he, I always saw him as, uh, I saw Robert Vaughn. I and wish. that made me like him a whole lot more. Well, Robert Vaughn really needed to have a part in Star Trek. I, don't, I can't believe he didn't. I just, it's, it, no, he, and, and I, don't, I don't want him to play crazy power mad admiral. I, I want him to have a good role. And me too. I was thinking, you know, the easiest thing that Robert wanted is just make him a Cardassian and call it a day. But he is so good as a hero. He is so layered and complex. Imagine him as an Auburn Tane. Robert Vaughn playing father to Elon Garrick. Uh, you know, I'll tell you, I think it's a brilliant idea. And at the same time, I can still love Paul Dooley. Okay. I think Paul oh, Dooley's yeah, that's just... The- you know, he's Robert, one of Robert Altman's favorite actors, and it's the because Robert because Paul Dooley is such a roly poly fat man that it's not the kind of part he would normally get. And let Ned Beatty in Network, mm-hmm. where Ned Beatty just rips out with this monologue from Mount Olympus. And you know, when you start to look a certain way in Hollywood, you only get certain parts. And it's so nice when you get a chance. Having said that, can I see Robert Vaughn as Andy Robinson's father? Yes. Can I imagine? This is the okay. So this is the this is the only problem with with him as Tane is that the whole essence of the Obsidian Order is that they're the last guys you expect. Yeah. You know they're the last guys you expect, and if you just meet Paul Dooley, you know you don't realize. He is this Mensa level intelligent, uh, ruthless. Killer. Yeah, like every bad thing that ever gets ascribed to Garrick, you know, like how he just stares at a man in a room, the man going crazy, and, and you know, all of that, all those great stories. And Tane does that before breakfast. 
let me on the off chance that anyone around uh, Paul Dooley sees this video. That 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 was not intended as any insult to him. I not at all. the heck out of him. Oh, of course. And you know the really Polly Fat Man thing. He 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 got cast as Wimpy. <laughs> In in the in the Popeye movie, I mean, I think everyone knows he's not Johnny Weissmuller. It's okay. But yeah, uh, one of my favorites. Yeah, it is just terrific. Just terrific. It got better and better and better every episode. I, it was that three parter at the end of season three. Uh, the die is cast, uh, and all of that, where you find out the Obsidian Order and the Tal Shiar are building this fleet of ships, and uh, He's restored. Garrick is brought back, and then he has to torture Odo. You can have you have every. Think of this: you're living your you know a good life. You're cast out. You're 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 living with the swine. You're you're just doing what you can to make it day by day. This goes on for however many years. You, you get to go back to that life, but however, there's a price. Yeah. Yep. The the one person. Who I, I believe Garrick respects Odo. Yeah. Maybe, I don't know if he likes him, but he, he respects him because Odo treats everybody with respect. You have to do this horrible thing to somebody you respect. Yeah. And and that that was a, a a a watershed moment, I think, for the fans and for the character of Garrick, because he, he'll do it, but you can tell his heart is not in it. Yeah. He doesn't want to do it. And it's like you know, damn it! Can I not put a phaser to Bashir's head? Can I? Can I not kill this one or that? Why do I have to do it to this one? The the, the honorable one, the, yeah. the, the one I respect. Uh, and uh, I, I, Garrick also uh, appears in. I can't say it's my favorite episode of the show, but it it may be one of the greatest episodes of the show, and it's an episode of the show that doesn't get the credit it deserves. I think because it flies under the it's a Garrick episode. See if you know what I'm talking about. It flies under the radar of of what we think of as great DS9 episodes. But if you and it kind of has a cutesy ending, so that defangs it a little bit. But if you watch it, there are so many hardcore truths. You know, I battle addiction issues, and I know that you've known people who battled addiction uh, issues. I've had my feet. Okay, uh, and I'm still you know working on some of mine. And it's the wire. The wire, yeah. I the the wire that. is just oh God. it. And and if you're dealing with addiction issues, it is the best metaphor that you can possibly use uh, to get people to understand. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It. Yeah. It. Uh, I've had my I've had my issues with the uh, alcohol. Thankfully, that's that's as far as my problems really went. But yeah, that episode. You know, you can look at it, and, and it. I don't know if I necessarily call that a cutesy ending. It's just him trying to, it's, for, for Bashir's sake, oh, in my yeah. opinion, to put a little bow on this. The, the cutesy part for me is that it is a medically fixable. Boop. Oh, okay, okay. That that not the they were all lies, especially the lies okay, or whatever. That's, what I, that's what I thought you no, were doing with that. it was it was the fact that it was kind of I, if they were doing it now, it wouldn't end that way. No. It wouldn't end that way, but but at the time with television, I think that's how they had to end it. And then there's Paul Dooley going, "Oh, here's here, here's what you need to fix that." Yeah. Why? Why? I thought you didn't like him. I want him to suffer. Yeah. There you go. You know, and uh, the one thing I'll say is that because the because the elephant in the room with any DS9 discussion, and this is proper for another broadcast, but I think is a worthwhile topic: is Babylon Five. And one of the things about Babylon Five is that in at least two places, uh, it deals with addiction issues and it doesn't walk away from them. It doesn't just kind of <laughs> fix it. Uh, and Straczynski, even though I have very mixed feelings about, about the gentleman, uh, he, he wrote a good show. He wrote a, he wrote a damn good show. And, um, and his, his dealing with that, I think, was very respectful. Well, it, listen, if we ever do Babylon 5, that'll be you guys, because I've never seen it. <laughs> you need, you, honestly, I just just as a student of television of that era, and as a student of Deep Space Nine, because we got sold on a false dichotomy. 
by a lot of different parties, Straczynski being one of them, that it had to be DS9 or Babylon 5. And they are both space-born, uh, massive war arc, kind of semi-Messiah-led franchises. Having said that, they are so different that you absolutely can enjoy both of them. And being a Dark Shadows fan, especially, the heavily serialized nature of Babylon 5 would appeal to you. I'd skip the first season maybe even skip about half of the second season and just jump in around midway of the second season and use Wikipedia to catch up. Um, it's been remastered, so it looks really good. Um, yeah, he can tell you I had nothing nice to say about Babylon 5 for the longest time. And uh, now I'm hard-pressed to find anything bad to say about it. Uh, it's it, I don't think a discussion of DS9 is honestly complete or comprehensive without kind of looking at its like earth five or something like that twin you know it's not earth two it's not earth three it's earth out there are you 486 or whatever it's it's way out there um but it's have you taken a look at it since it's been remastered Butch, my hand to God, it was really good. Wow. It, and there were dramatic moments. I, the dramatic moments on Babylon 5 have been carefully orchestrated over years. And, you know, with, with DS9, it feels like real life because things are sloppy. And, you know, things kind of resolve themselves sort of because they have to. And that's how real life is. Babylon 5 is literary in a very satisfying way so that when there is a big moment that satisfies a, a character arc or a story arc that's been going on for a while, um, it's, it has, it, it does, it is totally contrived. It's, it's totally artificial, but it has the kind of satisfaction of a very well-crafted recipe. DS9 is, is incredibly satisfying, well-done, focused jazz. Not the weird, you know, saxophone tuning in the back, you know, the sort of jazz fusion stuff, but, you know, sort of Gershwin, you know? Yeah. Uh, Babylon 5 is Bach. It's just this very layered, deliberate, mechanical, fractal, kind of thing and, and you can like both and yes and I, and we I, I were probably into that I remember me back too in the 90s but also um Babylon 5 got kicked around over on 43 a lot and everybody missed half a season and i'm like Who, wait who's this what's going on yeah and then try to watch it and oh god and you know, this is pre-internet, so you couldn't just go online. Okay, what was what happened before? And, and and I'll tell you, one of the other things about Babylon Five is that it had it had a lot of characters. It didn't have as many as DS Nine, and DS Nine did such a masterful job of covering all of these characters. And you know, doing that that last season, how the hell did they wrap up? I mean, they have like twenty five major characters. Babylon Five has fewer, and and certainly I think fewer principal characters but it draws them really exquisitely especially londo played by peter jurassic and jakar uh played by andres katsalas who plays captain tomalak the first commander. semi commander tomalak uh the first semi-recurring uh uh Wrong. tng villain yeah i really like I really love how Garrick blows up his shop <laughs> in Deep Space Nine. And I love the fact that he gets into a relationship with Galdicott's daughter. It was so, when I first saw that, it was so off guard to me because here's this spy. And because you sort of get that he's a spy, you're, you, as a viewer, to me, I don't know how you guys felt. I was sort of wary of him. For sure. Yeah. 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 Well, also for me, by then, like I said, I figured out that he was in love with um Bashir so it's like yeah. I, I at first I wondered is this some kind of no 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 we this is getting 
I apologize for putting this way. This is getting a little too gay. We need to we need to head show him up a little bit, and and which would not be out of the time period. I mean, I I can see some network or, or whatever right. saying, okay, that's enough of that. Uh, so at first I was I was kind of wary, and because and uh, I I grew to really like. See, that was Torres Zio, correct? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, I really liked her character. I liked the actress. It was a sign. I'll tell you what. It was a sign of her sanity because uh, one of the biggest mistakes that people make is loving, choosing to love someone who is familiar to them. And so if they come from an abusive household, they often pick an abusive partner. And because it's safe, the familiarity is safe. And Zial does exact. She can't find someone more opposite of her father. Than uh, than Garrick, and uh, and that to me was a it, it was both youthful rebellion and a sensible move to try and find something as as diametrically opposed to Dad as possible. I was shocked that when they get captured, they reveal Garrick's claustrophobic. I was shocked at that. Were you guys? Um, I oh, I'm shocked. I thought it. it it was a very, very, very useful, interesting twist. Yeah, it, it, and, and they used it well. It, it wasn't, in my mind, it wasn't one of those, oh, here's something we learned about this character for one episode and we'll completely forget about it ever again. No, they, they kept using it. And, so, and that episode was so good, where they're in the prison camp and they have to get out, right? Yeah. The, that's an example of what I love about DS9, especially fourth season onward four, five, six, and seven, is that you can you can just maybe if there's a if there's an okay episode, just wait. Just wait a week or two because there's going to be an episode that will suddenly be the best episode of Star Trek ever until you get to the next really great episode, which will be a couple episodes after that. I mean I DS9 is such an embarrassment of riches that every time I think, okay, this is just a, a great episode. Can't get any better news. I forget about the prison camp episode or or you know things like that. And it's just gosh, it's just such a gift. And that's something to go into the, the ones that are usually thrown out there, uh, you know, far beyond the stars and, and the visitor. Great episode. They're all fantastic. Out, you know. They're all but, great. Yeah, it's it's like it's such variety. Variety, topics, actors. It's 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 just a phenomenal show. The original series, I can't call it Toss. I'll, I'll write, I'll type that out, but I can't call it. The original series is my favorite because I grew up. I mean, it was on every week. Shatner, Nimoy, and Kelly, and and and, and, and Takai, and all of them are familiar. They're comfortable. Mm-hmm. I can throw an episode in, and it, it's it's almost a joke. How quick can I tell which episode it is? <laughs> you know, I know that planet, yeah. But Deep Space Nine is the best, and I will say that over any I've seen, original series, the uh, Next Gen, Deep Space Nine, Voyager, Enterprise. I've seen the first season of that's, Discovery. It's been a long run. I've seen the first series of, of season of uh, Picard. Yeah. I've seen the first episode of uh, the animated one, Lord X. Um, and as far as I'm concerned, Deep Space Nine is the best. It's, it's, it's really, really good. good. It's so good. It, it is. It's and, it, and you can watch it again. Uh, you know, every time I watch an episode uh, of it, whether intentional or you know, if I wake up in the middle of the night and it's on, and it's kind of like. I've come across a, an old VHS tape or eight millimeter camera, and I'm revisiting some old friends. Hey, this is the time we went here, or this is the time we did that. It's. I remember the show. I always remember the episodes as being fantastic, and yet they are never uh, in reality. Uh, they're always even better than I remembered them being. It's I have that experience with the movie Sleepy Hollow, which is a movie I like a lot, and I forget how good it is. And so I have to now make a mental note to remember it's that good, because it only occurs to me as I'm watching it. But DS9, when I come across those episodes, it's like, why can't TV still be like this? 
I um one one to, I try to remember which episode it was. It may have been the one where Quark gets involved with the Klingon lady. Um, oh yeah. But um, I had gone to Kentucky with my parents to visit uh, Randy Fox's parents, my adopted sure. parents. Yeah, yeah, Randy. And uh, you know, I didn't want to miss Deep Space Nine. I happened, I, I don't remember, I remember I fell asleep and I woke up and I went to the, the little TV room they had and I turned and I got lucky. The episode was coming on. I, um, complete random luck. And, you know, um, I loved going up there to, the, I said, this is my adopted grandparents' house. It just, you know, you go to your grandparents' house, you have a good time. And it was like, this part of my family was at this other part of my family's house. And it just, for, you know, for the hours, like my fa- families met, and and then this show was over, and I was like, okay, I turned off, went to bed, and that, that was it. But mm. yeah, it, every time I watch another episode or, or whatever, it's just like, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's some good stuff. It's one of those shows, and Dark Shadows has this quality where it it transcends being a good show, and Next Generation never achieved this, but DS9 did, and it becomes a companion. Yeah, it really does. So that's my We've been talking for a while about this. <laughs> I'm, getting, I'm getting tired. James Brown needs his little cape. Uh, yeah. yeah. I only have a couple more questions for you guys. I promise we'll wrap this up. <laughs> how how important was it that they cast Avery Brooks as Cisco, you think, Butch? Uh, <laughs> that's funny you say that because uh, much like looking over the casting, Clayton Endicott is, is Odo. And then only got Hawk is the captain. Uh, he played uh, a character named Hawk on the uh, Spencer for Hire TV series, and I, that's what I only I think that's really only I knew him from at that yeah, time. That was and I was like, well, okay, you know, he was he was his character was kind of inter- kind of interesting in the show. In fact, he was really the only thing on that show I watched it for. I was like, oh, is he going to talk to Hawk? I mean, no, okay, and then that changed the channel. I read it wrong. I thought it was Avery Schreiber. Was going to be playing playing Cisco. Kind of wrong. I was but, um, a little shocked. I, they um, they got it right yet again. Uh, great actor, did a great. Was asked to do a lot of things, and and he did them. And um, I, you know, a lot of people talk about when he shaved when when he shaved his head. When I don't know how many know he did. That's how he looked normally, and he would grow it out for the first mm-hmm. two seasons. And finally, he said, "Hey, can I just?" Can I do my hair like I normally do? Tired of looking like a hippie. <laughs> and, you know, really, third season is, there, let's not say there, there's great episodes in the first season, for this first season and second season, but third season is really, is that when uh, Next Gen went off the air? It was, it was when third season started. Yeah. Um, and for a very brief time, they were it. Yeah. It, uh, and it really, that's just when Deep Space Nine became Deep Space Nine. And, he did a great job. Um, I, I do find, I, I, looking at it later, you know, he doesn't do many interviews. He doesn't talk about it. You know, we went and saw uh, What You Left Behind. Yeah. And uh, then I, I think the only time they showed him was archival footage. Sure. Footage. Sure. It's late. I'm yeah. sorry. Footage. Um, but, you know, he's an interesting character in it. And I learned more from the William Shatner, the captain's interview. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I yeah. learned more about Avery Brooks there than I probably knew my entire life before then. But, yeah, I, he's great. He was awesome. And I remember thinking, yeah, it's, it's even at the time, I was like, yeah, it's it's time to have a, have an uh, have a, a African-American captain. William. It's time to have a woman. There's nothing wrong with this. We, we know we know what it is. So. He was the African-American one. Yeah, he was. Not the woman. <laughs> I really love the fact that here's he a, now. <laughs> I love I love Avery Brooks's performance as Captain Cisco. He's my favorite captain. I really love the fact that here's this guy. He lost his wife. He has a son. He he's not just in charge of a space station. He's a religious figure. This guy has everything on his shoulders and then some. More so than any captain really before him, in my opinion. He just does, and he d- deals with it. And I he's love it for it. What was that? I'm sorry. He's a candy mint and a breath mint. Yes. 
I'll tell you a slightly embarrassing story about that kind of involves me with Cisco and it just glued me with him is uh, when Emissary came out and we saw the, the fight when he went his ship at Wolf 359 and the whole thing with the with the prophets and they're like, well, why do you stay here? So you're looking at his dead wife and he just tearfully says, because I don't know how to move forward. Yeah. I had gone through a, a breakup, a, a bad breakup at the time, and not that I was, you know, uh, uh, in a really dark place, but I, I just hadn't moved on, and I was watching that, and I was just like, that that just me, I was like, that was me. It wasn't my dead wife, and I didn't fight the board, but I, you know, that was me. I'd been guilty of that, and so right after that, I was like, okay, you know, I I... Identified with him in a way I could, you know, who can identify with Kirk? Kirk is almost perfect in the original series. Picard, uh, without getting into my the two Picards, the Picards of next uh, next gen series and Picard of everything else, but Picard's pretty perfect. I mean, he's not perfect, perfect, but he's pretty perfect. Mm -hmm. Cisco was more human. He was broken, especially yeah. at the beginning of the episode. I'm um, sorry, at the beginning of the series. And he became, you know, even right there in the pilot, you see it. He's, you know, he walks in to, uh, uh, with, to Picard and he's like, we met in battle. And I just think, I wonder how many times that happened to Picard. Oh, yeah, I, had friend, I had friends at Wolf 35, now, even knowing he couldn't help him. But I liked him for that because he's like, you know, woohoo, you're Captain of the Enterprise. Yeah. But then at the end of the uh, episode, he's like, you know, he's, he's kind of made peace with it and he's starting to move forward. And he's like, you know, I think I'm going to stay. And, you know, and, he, and if I remember correctly, he shakes Picard's hand or does some kind of gesture. He, cur he curtsies. And you can see that he, he was broken, but he had he had reached that point. He, he's not healed, but he has he has got the point in his heart, if you will. He's got forgiveness, or whatever, and he's starting to move forward. And, and we, you know, we didn't, we don't, I don't, can't. Think of any other captain that we saw that through, not like series that. wise, not, not like no, that. No, Maybe no. one or two episodes. Of course, Picard and that, family or whatever, but that's, that's, that's one episode. Yeah. There's other characters I want to cover, but we'll do that in another episode. I'll ask this one last question: Who's your favorite director of Deep Space Nine, Butch? He asked me that question last week. <laughs> it was a tough question. Tony Dow. <laughs> Oh, no, Tony Dow just, uh, he's got cancer. Oh, no. Yeah, and he did direct some, some DS9 and Battle on Fire. My favorite director of Deep Space Nine. Joel, you could have gave me a little heads up on that, buddy. I, I'd have to look at I told you, Joel. I told you it was a tough question. But, yeah, but, it is. Let, let, the, let, the, let me apologize as a host. I'm sorry, gentlemen. You know, LeVar Burton did pretty good. <laughs> I got you. I got you. <laughs> you know, I would honestly, to answer that question truthfully, right. I would. What I need to do is like look up my favorite episodes and then look up who to review. If there's a recurring thing, you know, it was always you know, Lavar Burton or whoever, or he directed the majority of those. I, honestly, Joel, I can't. I, I can't answer that code, if you will. Right. No, that's fine. You don't have to. We'll get it next time. Um, Jim. <laughs> that's right. Gentlemen, it is always a pleasure. Captain Patrick McRae, Captain Butch Rosenbaum, it is always a blast with you guys. I want to thank you guys for taking the time to join me. Um, it is always a pleasure. But um, thank you. Just, no, you, thank you guys. Seriously, I appreciate it. Um, and as always, live long and prosper. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Thank you, guys. You guys have a great night. Bye -bye. You too.